Welcome yeah, back. Welcome back. Today, Today, we've got another, we've got another episode, episode of My Duvet, of my duvet flip. flip. The reason, the reason you get out of bed every morning every to morning flip the duvet, to, flip the duvet, to do something that you're passionate about. You're passionate and today, about. I'm, and with, today a I'm with a special guest, Sarah Bentley, Sarah Bentley the, CEO the CEO of Thames Water. How are we today? Hi, Jack. Hi, Thanks Jack. so Thanks much for having me. And what a brilliant way to kick off the new year. Really excited to be here. Thank you. So we always start with the first question. Where did it all begin? What was your first job? first job what did that job, did teach, that job you? teach you and what do you want to pass, want to pass on, on to others who are in their first job first whatever, it is. whatever it is well my well, first my first job first was paper round, round. I, guess like I guess people, like most people which i which did on I roller did skates because roll that was the that thing was in the, the 80s thing, that's, yeah. what you did. that's what you did um but um, actually but i actually, my first sort of proper long-term job was in the news agents which um i got used to pick up the papers from and i sort of moved on and i thought right at 15 i'd go and work in this shop and it was part news agent and part sweet shop and there's nothing, and there's that, nothing will that will attract a kid attract into kids, work, like a work, sweet shop, like one of those old fashioned old ones. Fashioned I mean, they weren't old fashioned then, fashioned they were just they were sweet just shops then. Um, which were like, like, yeah, like, like the, yeah, all the jars, the jars on the back, on the and you'd back, measure out your quarter out your pound of lemon sherbet, not a lemon sherbet, and all the different bars and all this sort of stuff. So I managed to get a job in there doing just doing like the odd shift on a Saturday. And I just got curious about how did it work, you know, how did it, how did a shop work? And so so the guy so that the owned, guy it, owned it owned two owned other shops two other in shops towns, towns nearby, nearby. and um, so um, and so I said to him, well, you know, could I do a bit more? You know, is there anything I could do a bit more? Anyway, to cut a long story short, I ended up running the shop so on the weekends because obviously I was still at school during the week. So I'd run it on the weekends. I'd schedule all the staff. I'd do all the stock taking. I'd order all the stock in, and I was just fascinated. You know, what are all the sort of violet creams that people like at Christmas, and you know, how do you make sure you've got the right Right. sort of seasonal, sort of seasonal sweets, sweets, make sure you've got healthy sure got sweets, healthy if there is such a thing, such a thing. Uh, at this time of year for everyone's New Year's resolutions. And it was just, brilliant. It was just and brilliant. And although and some of the some other people who worked in the staff were much older than me, they were mums of people I was at school with, I just was really just curious as to how to make it really lovely experience for customers, but also really efficient as a shop. And I remember him writing a job reference for me when I was you know, moving on after I'd sort of left school. And he said, you know, this person yeah, this really person knows really how to sort of to set sort things up, motivate people and run things. And I just, I looked at it and it was just a bit of paper at the time. But I guess looking now back at my career, it was sort of quite foretelling of what it was. But I think part of it was that I just loved working around sweets. Wow. There's three things you mentioned there that I want to kind of dig into a little bit more. Firstly, you said you was curious. We've had a number of superstars come and interview on the my duvet flip and they've all said one of the most important things they look for in a young person joining their organization is someone who's curious help us break that down in terms of what does curious mean to you and how can a young person who doesn't really have any experience of the world of work how can they be curious yeah, so I think it is a super important thing. I need to correct you. I'm definitely not a superstar. You've had some amazing people on. I'm just me, right? And you're just me who grows up in a pretty normal household, went to a normal school. And... But, but what my dad what did, my dad so, he did. Worked, so he worked, he used to teach he in higher education, higher education. So, he so he sort of lectured a bit and he did a bit of research as well. as well. And he was one of these, one of these that, like people who just like wanted to know how things work, you know, work, you'd take the hoover apart and, and you'd put it back together again and just try to make things work. And I was just interested in how things worked or what made people tick. And I think that thing around... It's very easy very to easy judge, judge things or people, or people at face value face and go, value oh, well, that's how it works, or, or not even or, think or not about even it, think or just, you know, just like in, in our job, you just turn on the tap and the water tap, comes out, and it, or, and or a bar, bar of chocolate. How chocolate. did that get there? But actually, it's quite interesting when you find out, well, how did that get there? How does the food get on your plate? You know, <laughs> how did the clothes get made? And when you look at that, then you sort of see all these things and you go, is that right? You know, is it right that it works that way? You know, you think about any of the supply chain, some of the things that we're thinking about around climate change and is it right to ship clothes or food across the planet or the type of workforce that are employed and the terms and conditions they're on. And you just sort of just peel layers off an onion and you just scratch a bit. So it's just, I think it's just about stopping and thinking about what's in front of you and going, is there more to it than that? Is there more to the glass of water? Is there more to this person than what I could just take at face value? So asking how? 
Yeah. Often how? How did that get there? How does that made? Yeah, and what, what makes people tick? You know, that bit, you know, what's that sort of, if you just double click in, what's behind what they said? And what, what do you mean by what makes people tick for those who may be sitting at the end of their bed watching today? Yeah. And what do you, what, TikTok? What make people <laughs> tick? What does that mean? Well, my kids definitely <laughs> TikTok. But it's just, there are things you love and things that you don't love in life. And, you know, all, all of my kids are really different and they've all grown up in the same household. They've been in the same environment, but some of them are arty, some of them like math, some of them are sort of, you know, make, like making things, some of them just like being with other people. And you, you sort of gravitate towards the things that you like. And they're like, what games do you like playing? You know, whether that's online games or physical games or, you know, what sport do you like doing? What subjects do you like at school? And just sort of figuring out where are the things that I, I like spending more time doing? Now, sometimes it's really difficult when you're a young person because you sit there and go, either you kind of sit there and go, well, I like doing everything. Or you sit there and go, well, I don't really know. <laughs> One of my lovely sons, you know, you ask him questions like, I don't know, I don't know. Right? So actually, it's IDK, you know, yeah. on, the, on the old text. And you sit there and go, well, just stop, just stop and think. You do know, but, you, but the easy answer sometimes is, well, I don't know. And it's like, okay, but just delve a bit deeper. Take a moment, really try to kind of think about what's going on in your head. And, you know, you'll soon figure out if you like it or not. Or just look at how you spend your time. You know, you'll spend your time doing things you like. So I, I, I think it's sort of just a question of just stopping and reflecting and not just kind of shrugging your way through life. Absolutely. So that's what makes you tick. It's find out what makes you tick by seeing what you're interested in. And that could be anything. If you're interested in computer games, then mm. you might want to go and work for a, someone who build games or sell games. Or yeah, yeah. Go and write some games. Yeah. You know, Absolutely. why not do that? You know, one of my kids loves looking at stuff on, online, right? She absolutely loves, you know, searching stuff online. And, and I keep saying, what are you doing? And she's like, just searching stuff up for nothing. I'm like, what? She's like, no, I'm just curious. Like, I'm just looking what's online. I'm like, well, why don't you write a website? Or why don't you write a search algorithm? And she's like, well, how can I do that? I'm like, well, go and figure out how you program. And I showed her, you know, how you click the button, which shows you the HTML code behind it. And now she's sort of... You know, she's interested, well, she's not interested in coding, but she's just sort of trying to, she's too young, she's just trying to figure out, oh, well, that's how the website's made. You know, maybe I could be interested in that. So it can be anything, really. Absolutely. Cooking. Got another daughter who loves her food. Okay. And she's just, you know, brilliant. We'll learn how to cook. Wow. Wow. Secondly, you mentioned in the sweet shop that you had a lot of older people around you. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about how a young person going into an organisation, they're going to have a lot of experienced people around them. I have a number of young people come to me and say, I'm scared to set up a LinkedIn profile because everyone's experienced and they've got all this experience to put on LinkedIn and I don't. What tips and advice would you give young people who may get, may get a new job or going for an interview and they're getting interviewed by an experienced person or they're joining a team and there's older people around the table, how can that young person adapt and kind of join that team in sync with the others? Yeah, so I think there's two things that are really important when you're starting out. One is everyone's got something to offer. Absolutely everyone. It doesn't matter if you're the most experienced person on the planet. It doesn't matter what your job title is. It doesn't matter where you work in an organisation. You might have just come out of school. You might have been in business for 40 years but everyone's got something to offer and you just got to figure out well what is it what what is it that you bring to the table you know a couple um, last year we had a reverse mentoring program where we had young people reverse mentor senior people because actually the whole world that, that young people are growing up in today you know with all the technology and you talked about TikTok and all this sort of stuff is sort of different for us we didn't have stuff like that when we were growing up. We didn't have mobile phones. So actually it's really useful to understand some of the challenges that people are struggling with, particularly if you don't, you know, you don't have kids around. So one is everyone's got something to offer. So just figure out what your thing is. You know, you look at what you're doing, you're representing young people because you realise actually that's something that you can offer because you know what the struggle's like. And the second thing I think to remember is everybody was young once. You know, we were all anxious teenagers trying to figure out what you know what to do that day or the next day let alone what to do you know the next month or the next year so we were all young once and actually 
the more you can ask questions, which I suppose comes back to the curiosity, just ask people. Um, people are incredibly generous with their time and incredibly generous with their ideas. If you're just brave enough to say, actually, do you mind just spending five minutes? I'd be really interested in, you know, when you started out, what it felt like. Absolutely. I love that bit of advice. Just ask the questions, be curious and go and ask for five minutes. Yeah. Absolutely. Everyone's got five minutes. Absolutely. And then towards the end of your sweet shop journey, yeah. your first job, you received this reference. Yeah. To me, when you said that, that just shows, that reads so much in terms of how you were in the role, but also that individual, your boss, taking the time to write that reference and saying what he did say, or they saying what yeah, they did yeah, yeah. say. How important is it to make sure whether you're applying for a job after an interview, leaving a job, how important it is to keep that bridge and that relationship? Because we have a number of young people that come to an interview and it might be at Google, it might be at Tesco, yeah. and then they'll leave the interview and they'll say, right, I don't like that brand. Well, and then they'll kind of discontinue and disconnect. Yeah. But I think the most important thing to do is keep humble, keep focused, yeah. don't burn any bridges and be kind. So what's your advice in terms of when a young person may just got a rejection from an yeah. interview or an application, how can they pick themselves up and not write back a little bit daredevilly? <laughs> well, it's, you know, it seems like a big world, but it's a small world. And there will be a good reason. You know, I've been rejected from jobs or um, graduate placements and stuff like that. And, and I always think that these things happen with really good reasons, you know. And actually, when I look back at the things that I didn't get, it, you know, there were reasons why I didn't get them. And actually, I learned through that experience. And you, you end up sort of sitting there saying, oh, well, you know, what, what do I take away from it? I think you can take loads away from those experiences because people aren't trying to sort of give you that rejection to kind of make you feel bad there's a reason why actually for you at that moment in your time they don't think that's the right thing to do and quite often it's probably not and another door will definitely open having said that you're bound to meet them again you know it is a small world out there in the world of work and you'll be amazed how actually you know, people who you knew once, I was talking to our chairman earlier on today, and he met up with his church youth group. And it turns out one of them's doing sort of international development and somebody else is in renewable energy. And actually they're all in and around some of the stuff that we do today. And so you could end up sort of reconnecting with people. So I, I never think that there's a moment in life where, you know, you should kind of turn your back on someone or turn your back on a situation because there'll always be a reason for it. And just try to understand it and just put it down to what can I take from it? And that works on both sides as well. Mm -hmm. If you've said no to someone as well, it's for instance, a young person said no to a job or something to also be graceful. I remember when I first started out going in to meet a CEO and they were being quite ruthless and not disrespectful because I'm not educated and from a degree background. And then probably around two months ago, they, they didn't have a pass to get into 10 Downing Street. And I was just walking in at the same time and I was able to get them through the door. But I left, even though I'm the elephant and I remember everything, I left what, how they treated me back then behind to focus mm. on now. Mm. And so it works both ways as well in terms of, and I love that bit of advice. Yeah, well, I'm sorry you were treated that way, right? I mean, we've, uh, yeah, we've all probably had experiences with people where you just say, actually, that's inappropriate in the workplace. And it doesn't matter what background you're from, where you're from, you know, everybody is an individual and need to be treated with respect. So I'm really, actually, really sorry that that happened. Um, and we, we're working really hard at Thames to make sure that whether it's through the various different programmes and schemes, you know, care confident, disability aware, you know, these different things, that we're really, really inclusive and, and businesses should be that. But it is right that if something's happened, it just, you know, it, it needs to be addressed. But actually, be the better person. You know, find the better angel of your nature and, you know, be that better person. Because actually, I don't know what grudges really help in life. Absolutely, absolutely. So after the fantastic experience at the shop, the sweet shop, where did you go next? What happened next? 
Well, I then, I went to university. So my dad was, um, as I said, he worked in higher education, but he was the first one of 14 grandchildren who went to university. So I'd sort of set it as a mission that I would go to university. Um, and I was the youngest of all the grandchildren from my generation of cousins. And I was the only one that was going to go to university. So I went to university. Um, but I ended up doing a bit of a hybrid course between what I wanted to do, or what my parents wanted me to do. And after a year and a half, I was just like, I don't want to do this anymore. Um, so I dropped out because I thought, actually, because I, um, I, can, I can actually just work doing this because it was partly, um, you know, sort of a vocational course. And I was like, I may as well just do it rather than learn about doing it. I was desperate to get hands on. So I dropped out, um, which, you know, was it the best idea? Anyway, it definitely was. Uh, it was a learning experience. Um, and so I worked really hard to pay off my debts um, and then decided that I wanted to travel, you know, and go out and see the world. Um, so I paid off my debts and saved enough money to get a student, uh, a student travel visa to Australia. So you had to prove you had a certain amount of money in your bank account. So I worked really, really hard, paid off my student debt, got the money and then got on a plane. And largely because I wanted to see a koala bear. I had a koala bear, a toy as a kid, and I just wanted to see one. Um, it turns out they're quite strange creatures in the flesh. But anyway, um, so I went down to Australia and I ended up working there for about a year and a half, you know, as long as the visa uh, let me work for. Um, and I worked in a hotel, I got a job in a hotel running reservations for a business hotel. And that's what got me into customer experience and digital, where it was all on paper and business customers would come back, but it was a bit impersonal. And I thought, actually, if we made it a bit personal, if we could remember who they were, oh, you're Jack from the UK, how was your travel? You know, it would just make it that bit more personal. And then we try to make the check-in process a bit simpler by, you know, because you know, you'd stand there for ages and they'd ask for your address again, even though you'd had to give it on the reservation and they'd ask for the credit card again, even though you'd given it on the reservation. So we got rid of all of that and made it super easy. So we made it personal and easy. And reservations went up from about 25%, which is not very good, uh, to 75%, which is pretty amazing in the hospitality industry because you, you, you've always got a bit of buffer. And I thought, gosh, if we could do that without any promotions, any price discounts, then actually it just shows you that actually being a bit more efficient and treating people well makes a really big difference. And that sort of changed my view on life. And I'm like, right, I'm going back to university and I'm going to learn about this business stuff. So there's a few things there. So you went to Australia due to a toy that you had. Not necessarily the best motivation, but yes, that is absolutely right. I so, still have the toy. So, so, so sometimes it's not always good to meet your role models or your, your, the inspiration. I, growing up as a kid, I was really inspired by Lord Sugar. Then I met him and I thought the same thing about, <laughs> as you did. <laughs> so it's a bit strange. Uh, so sometimes explore, go and sit, go and see things, but also don't be disappointed at the end if it doesn't yeah, work yeah. out to be the perfect picture. Yeah, I still love lots of things about Australia. And I doubt koala bears aren't bad. They're not quite as cute and cuddly as I thought they were. Um, but no, Australia was great. And I met my best friend there. She's coming over this year, I'm super excited. Um, so it was, it was really lovely, really laid back, totally different kind of sense of work-life balance as well, um, which was really, really fab. And then you talked about dropping out and doing this hybrid course between what you wanted to do and what your parents were doing. A lot of young people will be in two minds at home. My parents want to do this. They're doctors or they're lawyers or whatever it is, or they don't work. Do I follow their path? How can a young person make a decision to what they study, what they do next when it is picking those subjects at uni? Well, so again, I think it's two things. One is you've got to do what you love. I, and I say this to everyone I meet and my kids, um, you've got to do with what you love. Because if you're doing something because somebody else wants you to do it, you just won't do it very well. And you see people around the place who are doing the things that they really love. Back to your duvet flip and they get up in the morning and they do it. And you know, we all have bad days, even on the things that we love. But, but you keep going because it's something that you really want to do. And you know, I, I think any parent actually just wants their kids to be 
happy and fulfilled. Um, and actually it might not be their stereotype, you might need to talk it through with them, understand why they, they want you to do what you, you know, they want to do and help to explain to them you know, what it is that you really want to do and why, but really find that thing that you love. Now, obviously when you're a kid, you might not know that. And so you might need to be really sure. And so they might be just trying to help you actually navigate to what you really want to do rather than maybe the first idea or what your mate's doing. So it's sort of actually not your idea, it's your mate's idea. So I think the first thing is find something that you that really work hard to figure out what you love. And if you don't love, don't worry about it. You know, there'll be plenty of opportunities. I went back to university. I ended up with a first class honours degree. I ended up teaching the younger students the subject because I loved it so much. And, you know, when you do find what you love, you'll do it brilliantly. Absolutely. So We had the CEO Monzo in. Yeah. And he said, don't follow your passion, follow with passion. Yeah. I think that's a brilliant thing. I think that's absolutely brilliant. If you do what you love, you just do it better. Absolutely. And then, big part, because mm -hmm. I, I don't want to spoil what you do now, because we're going to get onto that and a bit about Thames Water. But that debt you had, and then getting rid of the debt by saving. And we had, obviously, our mutual friend, Charlie Nunn in yeah. uh, from Lloyd's Banking Group. And he talked about how he didn't start his pension until 30. I, I use the saying, help young people build their money powers. Yeah, yeah. What is your advice to young people? Right now, cost of living, things are extremely tough. Yeah. How did you go about saving to then be able to have enough money in your bank account to move to Australia? Yeah. And what's your advice to young people right now when it comes to money and, their, and your money powers? I th so it's really tough, right? And it's a particularly tough at the moment for you know all people, but particularly young people, where things are just so much more expensive than they were. And I remember this well, right? In the eighties, when I you know I was growing up, inflation was going through the roof, and you'd have mortgage rates in the teens. You know, this uh, kind of buying a house was it was just it just wasn't a thing that you'd even think about doing because it was so expensive to get a mortgage at 14, 15, 16 percent interest rate. Um, Do you but, mind just breaking down what a mor mortgage uh, uh, rate, interest rate is and yeah, what a mor yeah. mortgage is? Yeah, just no, for those. absolutely. So if you're buying a house, you've got to do two things. You've got to put a bit of money down as the deposit. So say your house costs £100,000, after keeping the numbers nice and round numbers, and you put down £10,000 as your deposit, then you're borrowing the other £90,000 on the house. But you don't just borrow it for free. So for every year that you borrow the money, you've got to pay interest on that mortgage and so if you're paying just one percent interest on the mortgage it's a small amount of money but if you're paying 15 percent you can work it out on 90 I should have done it the other way around on 110 it's sort of coming up to 15,000 pounds you know by the time that you um, spend the money on the uh, which is just the interest so that doesn't pay down your mortgage all that does is that pays down um, you know the interest because you borrowed the money because you've got to pay somebody because they've lent you the money so, you know, if you want to buy a house, you've got to save up all the money for the deposit, but then got to make sure that you can earn enough money, not just to pay the money you borrow back, but also the interest on borrowing that money on top of it. And that's what your mortgage is. And so you've got banks out there that, that lend you the money to do that. Um, I just realised I got all the numbers wrong in the maths there, so we'll have to go and correct our That's beautiful okay. maths. No worries. Um, but, um, which given I did maths as a degree is a little bit embarrassing, well, isn't it? Well, but then take that back then, that is a worry. It is a worry. <laughs> um, but I think that, that you know, the bit, the bit, although it's tough, I would really say just put some money away. If you can just put a little bit of money away, and it's always tempting that, that you know, everything that you get in, and, you know, particularly at the moment, but, you know, when I was paying it off, I'd have one meat meal a month um, because we couldn't afford meat. That was far too expensive. And I'd have, you know, very cheap cheese sandwiches. Love a jacket potato. There's nothing that says economy like a jacket potato. Um, and just, you know, be thoughtful about what it is, you know, that you're spending money on. And actually, do you really, really, really need to spend the money? Because any money that you put aside, a bit like Charlie said, with, you know, saving for a pension, just like interest, you have to pay people money every year to borrow it. If you're saving money, they pay you every year to put it away. So it grows. And this wonderful thing called compound interest is brilliant because if you put money in, they give you money 
And then the next year they give you money, not on, just on your first bit of money, but on the extra bit that they gave you the year before. And gradually that accumulates and accumulates and accumulates. And when you get to over 50, like me, you end up actually, you know, having saved a decent amount of money so that you can think about retiring. Um, so I would encourage all young people, however young you are, just start saving. And it might only be, you know, a, you know, a pound, um, but put it away and get used to that discipline of not just having everything that goes in, go straight out again. And you also save through a, more, uh, through a pension as well. Yeah. Right? Like opting into yeah whether it's savings or ISAs or pensions or there's lots of different ways to save but as long as you're just not spending it's a bit, a bit like uh, you know with all of these things if you're spending as much as you earn you're never going to save anything <laughs> this is I'm telling myself this about weight loss if I eat, eat as much as I expend I'm never going to lose weight um, there's, you've got to have a little bit of an imbalance there absolutely absolutely and that's all we've got time for for the first half and we'll be back in under five minutes with the second half. See you in a minute.
two, and we're with Sarah Bentley, the CEO of Thames Water. What a fantastic first half. What I took away from that is be curious, ask the questions, work out what makes you tick, and remember that we're all at one stage in our lives, whatever age that is, it's all about stage, not age, and we all went through things that we felt overwhelmed with, we all went things through, through things that we didn't know, and we all had to start somewhere. Like I say, you don't start at the bottom, you start at the beginning. So Sarah, part two. Yeah. Right, so we've talked about your first job and then your uni experience. How did you become CEO of Thames Water? What happened and what was the kind of journey to get there? Yeah, well, you have to fast forward quite yes. a bit. Um, I, you know, uh, I'm, I'm older than I look. Um, but, I, you know, I, I, I guess a couple of things. Firstly, I didn't really ever set out to be a CEO and I certainly didn't really think about water. What I knew is that I really loved being in environments where I could make a difference to customers. And customers, like everyday people, who really affects their lives, and the, you know stuff that was really tangible and made a difference. So I mentioned before about you know working in a hotel for business travellers, and if you're travelling on business, actually having something that's a bit personal but super easy is just so important because it's quite exhausting when you're travelling, and so that made a difference. So you know I knew that I loved working with customers. I'd also done some stuff. So after I left Australia, I actually then. Went and lived in Germany. Uh, I worked there for a bit and then I went to Switzerland working in sort of technology firms and again they were technology firms that were all about sort of customer data and how to make you know customer information and sort of for retail you know shops and things like that. Um, and then I went to the States uh, and I worked over there, I worked in Silicon Valley and like looked at some innovative technology and I think that was my curious gene coming up going well, this is what we can do with technology now, but what could we do with it? And this was in the mid 90s. So before the dot com boom, there wasn't a thing called the internet. Yeah. Can you believe that? Pre-internet. I know. I know. <laughs> so, um, and, you know, I was there and it was like right in Silicon Valley, right at the height when people were thinking about this thing called the internet and what could it do? And it was just sort of really exciting about all the possibilities that were available with technology. And actually, I, because I'd worked in some big businesses, which were sort of hard work and a bit cumbersome, and I'd worked in some really engaging startups, I was like, how brilliant it would it be if you got the two to work together? And, you know, my kids are always getting me to get that best of both bread, um, you know, and, um, and, you know, if we could do that best of both. So all of that um, scale and capability that these big businesses have, but really look at them in a different way and apply technology in a different way. And so that got me involved in doing all that sort of stuff. And then I met my husband and came back to the UK and, um, and I realised that actually I liked doing that when things were in a bit of a pickle. So I went in and I um, actually was, became chief exec of a company that sort of did technology that was focused on customers, but was in a bit of a pickle and, and needed to be turned around. So it was a company that was six weeks away from bankruptcy and it needed to be saved so that the people who worked there, their jobs would be saved. And so I decided to throw myself into it because I'm quite good at fixing things. And that's what I did. So we, I turned around that company and then I went and did some consulting for a bit and helping other companies that were thinking about customer stuff and thinking about technology stuff and thinking about fixing things. Um, and then I ended up getting a call to go to another water company that was doing a, actually a, a, an okay job but wanted to be better and actually arguably now is one of the leading companies in the sector. Um, and, and I thought, water? You know, what's water all about? You know, you just turn on your tap, it comes out, as you know, uh, and you flush the loo and off it goes. And I thought, well, maybe there is more to it than that. Maybe there is more to it than that. And then I realised this wonderful world of water out there. And, you know, right the way through lockdown, we talked about all the key workers. You know, we talked about the amazing people in the NHS and the people who took our bins away and the people who worked in supermarkets or the delivery drivers that kept us going with things. But one thing that didn't really get talked about very much was the people who work in water. And if you can imagine your life without water, it would start to look, really difficult really quickly you know and whether that's your cups of tea that you love um, or whether that's having a shower or whether that's just simple sanitation like being able to wash your hands or flush the loo and I thought well actually if I could go and use those skills I had about how to really think about customers and how to think about technology but to do something that's so important to people's lives but actually 
really important for the environment it's not just us that depend on water it's all of the you know the fish in the rivers and bird and wildlife you know the environment really really depends on the water cycle working well so i went and did that and then um and i really really loved it and then thames came along and you know thames is a turnaround right it, it's had really poor performance you don't need to do much googling to figure out you know some of the real challenges that the company have faced and it sort of felt like this real gift that it was something that was really about customers really about technology really about the environment really needs fixing and then I found out my great-granddad was a well borer for the Metropolitan Water Board here in London. So he dug some of the wells that we're now drinking water out of. So I'm like, okay, maybe it's meant to be. So this rather circuitous shop from 11 bonbons all the way sort of around the world sort of leads you to a place which actually feels absolutely where I'm supposed to be in my life right now. And I love it. So tell me a little bit about Thames Water, because when you arrived here, you told me off, didn't you? I did tell you, you off. Tell why did I tell you off, Jack? You told me off because I drink bottled water. And, and you told why me is off. that bad? It's bad because actually tap water is a penny. It is less than a penny. Less than a penny, where a bottled water is more than a pound. Right. So, but I'm drinking tap water right now. Excellent. Um, I will toast to you I, on I your, your tap water. Again? You are now back in my good book. Much better for the environment. <laughs> you don't want all that plastic waste out of those bottles. True and much cheaper. And you know, we we're talking earlier about a cost of living crisis and what better way to save money than drinking very good quality tap water at your tap. So tell me, tell me some of the, the exciting things that Thames Water are working on right now. Yeah, so that you I can mean, share. yeah, no, absolutely. So, you know, Thames Water, just for, for those watching who don't know, we um, are the largest water and wastewater company in the UK. We serve London and the Thames Valley area and 25% of the UK's population. Um, you drink Thames Water and when you flush your loo, we take your waste away and we do interesting things with it. So we've got a couple of things going on. As I mentioned earlier, firstly, we're in a turnaround. So, and we can't really get onto the exciting stuff until we address the fact that actually water companies generally, and Thames in particular, has had too many leaks. So too much wasted water that's leaking, um, too many customer complaints and too much pollution. So you read about sewage going into rivers um, and, you know, which is, not good, right? And it's not good for the environment. So I've been brought in two years ago to turn the business around and that's what we're absolutely doing. And we're having to fix some real basics and then we've got to raise the bar, get our standards up and then really shape the future. And part of that is, I know I've got basics to fix. We've got to leak less. We've got to stop the pollutions. We've got to make sure our performance is better. But actually, even when we do that, and I know that we'll do that, we will turn the business around. It won't be enough. And so when I think about some of the shaping the future, that's where it gets really, really exciting. Because actually we take this for granted Absolutely. and you know, in the next sort of 20, 30 years, we're gonna be run out of water. We saw it over the summer, didn't we, with the drought where actually the, t the climate's really changing. We're using water in a really different way. You think about how frequently people shower now to, you know, how they used to take the, you know, a bath and not every, a bath yeah, every day, you know. Nice. Yeah, exactly. But not every day, right? You know, and so now we might shower once or twice a day. You know, we, you, you know, you think about things like hot yoga. There was no such thing as hot yoga before. And, you know, so we've got a very different relationship with water and how we're using it. And there is only so much water. You know, there's only so much water on the planet and there's only so much clean water that can be treated so that you can drink it. So we've got to really think about how we use water. Um, and it's stuff like, is it right that we use clean drinking water to water our lawns or to mm. wash our cars. You know, try to imagine explaining that to someone in sub-Saharan Africa that's got to walk hours and hours and hours to, you know, get pretty grotty quality water for them to use for all of their hygiene. You know, and here we are with amazing quality drinking water that we're just chucking on the lawn. So we've got, we're doing some really innovative projects to say, how can we not waste as much water, so we're stopping our leaks, but also how do we make homes much less water using, so much more water efficient. And so we use less water, whether that's less water when you flush the loo or whatever. And then on the other side, what we're doing with poo is super, super exciting. Most people don't like to talk about poo. And I'm quite sure that many people watching this are thinking they go, ooh, sewage, but it is amazing. <laughs> and what some people think of waste, 
we do incredible things with. So one of the things that people don't know is we're the largest renewable energy provider in the southeast of England. So we take that poo and we turn it into renewable energy. I mean, how brilliant is that? So there's a whole scope to do even more. And actually, we could create a huge amount of district heating from the heat from sewage. So this is a pilot that we're doing at the moment to say actually, because obviously sewage comes to us at body temperature without putting you off your water. Um, but by the time it comes to us to, to be treated, it's about 12 or 16 degrees. But by the, the water that well, once it's treated that it's got to go back into is about six degrees. So we've got quite a lot of heat. And if we could capture that heat and put it into district heating for you know apartment blocks and things like that, what a brilliant way Absolutely. to wow. heat London. So we're doing some real innovation to try to push the boundaries on how we can really change the dial, whether it's net zero and renewable energy or thinking about the environment and helping protect water for future generations. And within that, we've got really frontline jobs right the way up to scientists and engineers and these whole career opportunities in between. Wow. Isn't that an excite? Who knew? Who knew? You'll be thinking about your tap differently <laughs> when you turn I it will. on. I and do. you'll I never flush get... the loo in the same way again. <laughs> Absolutely. There are people in North London who are heating their baked beans by renewable energy from sewage. Wow. And break down some of those roles. Yeah. So I'm a young person. I'm like, yeah. okay, I, I like what Sarah said about poo. I like what Sarah said about doing good for sustainability, the climate and everything in between. Where, what are some of these roles? Tell me some of the front end roles and tell yeah. me some of the kind of more interesting roles that weren't there five years ago. Well, there are all sorts of there are all sorts of interesting roles. So we've got um, a bunch of roles where, you know, we've got people out. I was out at the depot this morning with some of the teams who are out moving um, weir boards around in London. So underneath all of the streets in London, you've got all this pipe network. We've got 109,000 kilometers, um, which go around the world several times, oh. of sewer network. And at any one time, you know, the sewage is going down that. Sometimes rain gets into it as well. Sometimes you get misconnection, but all this stuff out of your washing machine. And we've got to figure out where all those flows are going and make sure that they go to our treatment works and don't discharge into the river. So they're constantly monitoring these things. Now, one of the other things that young people absolutely could and should do is stop using wet wipes. They are horrible, horrible, horrible things. They're really bad for the sewer system because they get them all blocked up, mm -hmm. but they're really bad for the environment because they end up going to landfill. And every day we take 30 tonnes of wet wipes out of our sewers in East London. Wow. And so we have teams of people where these wet wipes go through and they get stuck on like, you know, you shouldn't also tip your fat down or your custard down the sink because that gets congealed. You should put it in a pot and put it in the bin or preferably compost it if you've got a garden. Um, so, you know, if, if uh, that, that fat gets congealed with wet wipes causes a blockage. So we've got people who are unblocking that. We've got other people in water treatment works who are out and about and they are, you know, moving valves. They might be electricians, they might be doing pumps, they might be high, um, uh, the, uh, uh, lorry drivers moving our tankers around and stuff like that, where we're putting tankers of water around the place. So we've got loads of front entry jobs, but we've also got sort of entry jobs in our labs where we're testing, you know, so we test water all the time, whether it's river water or drinking water, and they're doing sort of a bit like a chemistry lesson at school. So we've got labs and we've got sort of frontline jobs in labs. And then we've got all the people, obviously, who talk to customers who are out and about, whether they're digging holes and mending pipes in streets or whether they're speaking to vulnerable customers about their needs if we had an operational incident. So they might be going and speaking to some people on the vulnerable customers register that we've got. Or they might just be dealing with their bill in the contact centre or doing answering their, you talked about social media, they might be answering tweets or Facebook posts or things like that. So we've got a whole range of jobs. In fact, we've even got a shepherdess. Ooh. who looks after our flock of sheep, who wow. munches all the grass on our reservoirs. Oh, so we have sheep. We have sheep. Yeah, wow. We have a big flock of sheep. Did that make you surprised when you joined? And you, it did, <laughs> it did. And sheep. I love the sheep. Lambing season is very lovely at Thames Water. Uh, but you know those big uh, reservoirs that you see at Heathrow and you see the sheep there, they're really, really important because if you can imagine the, that reservoir, it's really important that that is a solid structure because you don't want that water escaping out. So the grass can't grow very long um, because otherwise we can't 
check that mm. the, the structure is safe. And so the, the sheep are sheep. very important reservoir inspection technicians, we like to call them, wow. who munch away so we can see that the reservoir is safe. Wow, and are, are all those sheep apprentices and grads? Well, the shepherd, you could get a shepherdess <laughs> apprentice. Yeah. Who knew? So, and there's roles for apprentices and graduates as yeah. well to come and join. So we've, we've part of our skills strategy is um, because we really passionately believe that we serve a diverse community and we need a diverse and inclusive group of people to reflect the communities we serve. But it's also part of our company purpose to make sure that com customers, communities and the environment thrives. That's why we're here. And so we want to not just do the do, we want to do it in the right way. And so making sure that we have a real good social purpose about how we do things is important. So we've signed up to a whole load of schemes. Our apprenticeships have really you know, taken off. So we've now got 168 apprenticeships wow. across a range of different roles um, you know, throughout the company. Um, as I said, it might be digital jobs, it might be you know, digger drivers, we've got some really cool diggers. You know, it might be in cool. construction, different bits and pieces. We've got 10,000 black interns and we found some real specialist skills that just wouldn't have been accessible unless it was there. Care leavers, mm. so we're part of the care leavers um, accreditation because again, you know, making sure that we help communities thrive is really important because a thriving community is going to be a really key part of the environment that we serve. Um, and so making sure that it's accessible for a whole range of different people is something that we're really passionate about. Wow, so, and to, to go and find out about those careers, go over to the Thames Water website, which we'll link in the below. Yeah, brilliant. So We've, there's can check loads them out. of such a right from, as I said, an archaeologist, shepherdess, digger driver, you know, we're doing all of these incredible things. And we've got cyber experts and all sorts. Wow. So it's a real range to get water to your tap. We've got two minutes left. Right. Yeah, so I've got two more questions. So my first question of the two is, What's one life lesson that you'd love that you, you wish that you knew earlier that you'd love to share with young people? Yeah, I mean, there's so much to go, but I would say just never give up. Um, you know, I chopped and changed. I did different things. And, and I remember kind of in my sort of mid career, probably at the sort of when I was coming towards the end of my 20s, early 30s, I sort of felt like I'd chopped and changed and I'd seen other people who'd st started with one thing. You mentioned lawyers or doctors or, but even, you know, a, a kind of different professions where they'd gone in and they'd said, right, I'm going to do this. And they'd stuck with it and they'd done it. And I thought, am I ever going to find my thing? Um, and actually now when I look back at it, all of those different experiences all led me to here, which feels like the perfect place. So although they kind of, you can't quite see it, the future is emerging just in the way it should. So keep going and keep believing in yourself and keep trying new things. And my final question is, what's your duvet flip? What gets you out of bed in the morning to flip the duvet? Well, cheekily, obviously my duvet flip is my tea's maid. Mm. Um, I talked to, to you earlier about my mm. lovely tea's maid. I can't get out of bed without a good cup of tea. Um, and that thing is just my favourite gadget. Uh, but if it's not my tea's maid, it's about really making a difference to communities and to the environment. Because I think what we can do here is not just do the job that we have to do, but do it in a way that actually helps make people's lives better for today, but for future generations. And I just hope that someday a great, great grandchild of mine will look back at the time I spent at Thames and be as proud as I am of my great, great grandfather who dug a few wells. Wow. And on that note, I just want to say thank you so much for investing your time, your energy and your wisdom in coming on today. Jack, an absolute pleasure and honestly a real treat and an honour to be here. Thank you. And that's all we have time for today. Whether you're tuning in from LinkedIn, Twitter, uh, youth space, wherever you're tuning in from. We've had a, such a fantastic conversation. We've learned a little bit about drinking tap water and not to put wet wipes down the toilet. Remember that, really important. And even your custard, put it into a can, put it into the, not into a can, into a jar, put it into a bin, really important. And But also really focus on what makes you tick. What makes you get out of bed in the morning? What are you passionate about? And if you don't know what that is, Go and follow the pathway. Check out the careers on Thames Water. Check out what's going on in the water space and the water industry as a whole. And do it with passion. So on that note, thank you so much. Thank you to everyone listening. And thank you, Sarah. Great. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Oh, that was good. Great.